Good afternoon, guests, and welcome to The Weekly with Dr. Tong. This is your way to stay up to date with everything healthcare related across the country. This week, we'll be joined by Dr. Amandeep Randawa, a podiatrist whose practice includes foot and ankle surgery. She will share her broad experience in diabetes with us and then be available for questions. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. Submit your questions throughout by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Elliott will answer as many questions as possible live, but all will be answered by case managers in writing. Now, here's Dr. Tom. Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to the 13th edition of the weekly. I guess it's been 13 weeks of COVID because that's where it all started. Today, we will focus on diabetes and foot health. Our guest and content expert today is podiatrist Dr. Amandeep Randawa my go-to diabetic foot doctor, who will enlighten us on all things podiatric and what happens when I send you to her in her clinic. Patients ask, why do you always ask about my feet and examine my feet? Well, the reason is that the feet have the longest blood vessels and the longest nerves. If there is any damage to the blood vessels and nerves, it will show up first in the feet. I well remember when I was a trainee, my professor told me, Tom, as a diabetes doctor, the most important part of the physical examination is the feet. I don't care if you listen to the heart or the lungs, but if you fail to take off the patient's shoes, you'll really put your foot in it. So what is it about uh, diabetes that damages the nerves and the blood vessels? I think you've seen this slide before. You, you saw it when we spoke about the heart, when we spoke about the eyes, you'll hear it when we speak about the kidneys in two weeks time. And it's equally important with the feet. They've got the longest nerves and the longest blood vessels and they get damaged by all the same things. Smoking in particular is bad for the blood vessels of the feet. A1C time in range blood sugar, that is by far the biggest determinant of whether or not you'll develop nerve damage. And then blood pressure is an important factor as well. And finally, cholesterol important for the blood vessels. I don't want to steal any of Dr. Randawa's thunder, but I do want to talk a little bit about diabetic neuropathy. Neuropathy is damage to the nerves. It occurs most frequently in the feet because it's got the longest nerves and they're most susceptible to damage. You know that there's a problem with your feet if you notice numbness, burning or pins and needles. If that is persistent, it almost certainly means there's diabetic nerve damage. And then what you need to do is all the things you already know about, fixing the sugar. Next week, by the way, we're looking at carb counting again uh, and insulin adjustment. So that'll be a reminder to what you need to do. Now, nerve damage may affect any nerve in the body, not just the feet. It can cause uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is is two or three times more common in, in people with diabetes than those who don't. It can cause dropping of the eyelid, which typically gets good on it, better on its own. It can cause foot drop as well. And rarely it can affect the muscles and cause weakness. How frequent is neuropathy? Well, um, one of the things about doing the weekly is that it, it's, it's keeping us honest. And each week we do a database query and we look at just, just how well we're doing. So if you have type one diabetes, there's a 21% chance you have diabetes. Now you've probably, people with type one have typically had diabetes longer than people with type two, but the problem with type two diabetes is that it often goes undiagnosed for many years. So in type two diabetes, 32% of patients have some neuropathy and typically it's a little bit of numbness, occasionally it's pain and painful neuropathy can be very difficult to treat. What about peripheral arterial disease? So peripheral arterial disease is blockages of the arteries. In this uh, visual on the right, you see the red ones, that, they're the arteries and they can get blocked anywhere. Um, if they get blocked above the knee, patients often have cramping and pain in their calves when they walk. And that's called uh, intermittent claudication. Um, if the bl blockage of the blood vessels is lower down, which is very common in people with diabetes, then it can manifest as ulcers that don't heal. And there's a big contribution from, uh, from neuropathy as well. 
and occasionally the toes will become gangrenous or turn black. And that's all because of starvation of oxygen and the nutrients. If, you're, if your ankles are swollen, it, it's probably not blockages of the arteries. Arteries are blood vessels that take oxygen rich blood from the heart to the periphery. It's more likely to be prob a problem with the veins. You might have varicose veins, or occasionally there'll be problems with the kidney and the heart. Just back on that one slide a bit longer, um, Luke. Um, how do we know that there are problems with the blood vessels? Well, you might tell us because you're you're, you get pain in your calves when you walk, or we may find that when we examine your feet, we can't feel the pulses. Occasionally, we'll measure the blood pressure in your ankles and compare it to the blood pressure in your arm. That's called the ABI or ankle brachial index. And we use that in research and we'll get to that later. And sometimes your feet will look pale and that's not a good sign. Next slide, please. So how common is peripheral artery disease? I should, before going on, peripheral artery disease is just another manifestation of atherosclerosis, which is the condition that causes blockages of the arteries in the heart that cause heart attacks and angina, and blockages of the blood vessels in the neck and the brain that cause stroke. Fortunately, peripheral artery disease is not particularly common. You can see in type 1 diabetes, 3.4% uh, are affected, uh, and in type 2 diabetes, it's 4.7%. Well, what about ulceration? Ulceration is, is, is one of the commonest significant complications of diabetes, and that would often be a reason that I would send you to see Dr. Randawa. It too, fortunately, has a relatively low uh, prevalence. Prevalence is what proportion of people have it. So 2.3% of type 1 and 3% of type 2. And given that, that uh, we have thousands of patients with type 2 in our practice, I know that we have more than 60 patients with active ulceration at this time. And if ulceration gets bad enough, and if it's combined with blockages to the arteries, which is very common in diabetes, then amputation becomes necessary. You can see that the, the risk of amputation in type one is 1%. In type two, it, it, sorry, in type one, it's almost 3% common because they've had diabetes for so much longer. Next slide. Well, I think it's time now for me to introduce our guest and uh, content expert, uh, Dr. Amandeep Randawa. Uh, Dr. Randawa was born and raised in East Vancouver, went to podiatry school in Philadelphia and did a residency in Los Angeles. After returning to Vancouver in 2012, she set up practice as Metro Vancouver Podiatry and I should, she's got a great website, you should check it out. She now serves three clinics uh, all in East Van, one on um, Grandview Highway, another on Kingsway, and the third on, I've forgotten, she'll tell us. She also has a, sur a surgical podiatric practice, so she'll do uh, local anesthetics and um, do significant surgery on the foot. Dr. Randawa is very busy in the community as a guest writer for the English language newspaper, the Indo-Canadian Voice, and makes regular radio appearances on RJ1200 and Red FM. Um, Amandeep, we were on Red FM yesterday. Actually, Dr. Bobby Sidhu, one of my staff, uh, was on there as well. Uh, Amandeep comes from a medical family. An older brother's a psychiatrist and a sister is an optometrist. The family joke is that she and her siblings have you covered from head to toe. She lives in East Vancouver and spends her free time crafting, going to the movies and swimming in outdoor pools options that both she and the rest of us hope will become available again soon. Most importantly, she enjoys spending a lot of time with her nine-year-old niece and 11-year-old nephew. Enough of the introduction, Dr. Randawa, welcome to the weekly. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm really grateful um, to be invited and I'm looking forward to this. I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, hopefully this works well here. Um, so I do have a few slides that we can just kind of quickly go through. See how that works. There we go. Um, so yeah, we're just going to talk about uh, diabetes and, and how it impacts your foot. And uh, Dr. Tom did a great job already at uh, outlining the basics of there. You know, the two biggest things are circulation problems, which our, our blood supply tends to decrease with age, but certainly with diabetes as well. 
And then the nerve damage or the neuropathy, um, which starts often as tingling and burning and can lead to complete numbness. We'll also touch a little bit about prevention. And, you know, let's talk about prevention right now, first and foremost. What do you need to do as a diabetic um, on a daily basis to try and decrease your risk? And it's actually quite simple. It's as simple as taking a visual look at your foot. When uh, we're diabetic and our nerves aren't, ne aren't necessarily as good as they were pre-diabetic, diabetes, we don't want to trust our sensation, right? We want to take a visual look to make sure there's no cuts, no bruises, no wounds, anything like that on a daily basis. If you can't see the bottom of your feet, use a mirror. You can also inspect your socks and take a look at your shoes. It's not uncommon for people to take a look at their feet and say, wow, I have a really big wound there. And the earlier we catch it, the better. Um, in terms of the complications, again, Dr. Tom went through most of those, peripheral arterial disease, uh, neuropathy, calluses, ulcers, cellulitis, which is an infection, gangrene, um, as he talked about the black toes. Quite often, we also will incidentally do an x-ray and a patient will have a sewing needle or something in their foot that they never knew was there. Um, because of their lack of feeling. And as things get worse, you know, these open wounds and ulcers can lead to a bone infection caused osteomyelitis, bone death as an as avascular necrosis, and deformities like the Charcot foot. So you'll see on the bottom of the screen, on the right hand side, there's a patient who has um, his, the foot on the right is deviated out. He wasn't born that way. This foot was exactly the same as the other foot. They had symmetrical feet more or less, uh, but unfortunately, with the changes of the diabetes, as the infection wears on and as the bones start to disintegrate um, due to the neuropathy, the foot changes dramatically in shape and you can get ulcers. On the bottom left-hand side of the screen, we can see that ulcers um, and foot infections can start quite easily. It can be simply a callus that gets really thick and we don't notice that underneath there's a wound. So we really wanna take care of those um, sooner than later. How do we lead to amputations? Well, generally amputations happen when we're not aware of a wound. Most of them start as small wounds and that's why we talk about the importance of visually taking a look at your feet every day. And anytime you see a wound, whether it's small or big, you wanna get medical help. Um, because your circulation is impaired, wounds won't heal as fast either, which leads to the uh, higher risk of amputation. So you want any and all wounds to be evaluated by your doctor or podiatrist. The truth is, if we can keep off of your feet when you have an ulcer, and we, you know, there's a variety of ways we can do that, a lot of ulcers, most wounds will heal. I think that we, we saw there's a 3% risk of ulcers, which uh, of amputations versus a 30% risk of ulcers. Um, when you have an ulcer, what do you do? So if you come into my office and you have a little bit of, a, you have a small wound, what we're gonna do first of all is just clean it out. We're just gonna take away any of the dead tissue and we're gonna do that so that any medications we put on top of the wound can get absorbed and will actually help. And putting medication on a wound that hasn't been cleaned, not ideal, and this is best done by a podiatrist. Often we do it weekly, sometimes it only needs to be done once a month and that changes during the duration of the wound. Lots of different medications and ointments, topical um, products, many, many different topical products that can apply to different wounds depending on where it is and what kind of a wound it is. We generally have wound care clinics and nurses in the lower mainland that can help with this. Um, and then certainly, you know, if there's an infection, it can be topical antibiotics. Sometimes you need to take a pill and sometimes you'll need to go into the hospital to have IV antibiotics as well. The most important thing out of all of this is the offloading. A wound that is being walked on or that is moving is not going to heal very well. Usually we can offload a wound simply by putting an insert into your shoe that has a, a little delve in it where the wound is. Sometimes that's not enough and we have to put you into a total contact cast, which is a full cast, which takes complete pressure off of the wound and allows it to heal. Of course, managing your blood glucose levels is very important and also gets harder when you have an infection, but that's where staying connected to your entire medical team would be really helpful. We've talked a little bit about offloading today and you know, I get a lot of questions about what's the difference between a custom orthotic and an orth you know, over-the-counter insert and, and they're really quite different. Um, a custom device is where we take measurements or scans of your feet, either versus casting or 3D laser imaging scan and take something where we look at the mechanics of your feet, the way that you're walking, where you have high areas of friction, 
which is where you're likely to get wounds and ulcers, and we balance that out. Um, one of the concerns a lot of patients have is like, I don't want to wear big, ugly medical shoes. And thankfully, these days, you don't have to. We can get an orthotic usually into most of your regular shoes. When you're being casted for an orthotic, there's a lot of different disciplines. I obviously recommend you get your orthotics from a podiatrist. The most important thing when you're being casted is that you're not putting weight on your foot. If they're having you walk across the machine or they're pushing your foot into foam, you're not, you're getting basically a glorified cushion. So you really want your foot held in a corrected position when you're looking to get a custom insole or insert. I was asked to speak a little bit about what podiatry looks like in BC. Uh, here we do not need a referral. You can simply call the office directly to make an appointment. It also means though that podiatry is not fully covered. Um, it was deregulated at the same time optometrist was uh, many, many years ago. For individuals who are on disability or who are eligible for supplementary benefits, uh, you get a subsidy. And there are some offices, uh, including mine, that will not charge you above that subsidy. So you'll be seen basically for free. If you don't have those benefits, um, extended healthcare benefits, Blue Cross Sun Life, places like that, almost always reimburse both the cost of seeing a podiatrist as well as offloading materials, uh, whether it be an orthotic or a shoe. The podiatrist really will treat anything that's got to do with your foot or ankles. Uh, and as Dr. Tom mentioned, we do do surgery as well when needed. Uh, in terms of how much it costs, every podiatrist sets their own fee structure. There is a suggested guideline from our provincial association. Um, for an example, at my office, an initial visit is $95. Follow-up visits are 65. Sometimes follow-up visits aren't charged. If we're just gonna come in and review x-rays, it's gonna be a quick check-in. Quite often we don't charge at all. And for individuals with supplementary benefits, if you have remaining visits available, and I'll explain that in a second, it's free, otherwise it's $30. For the supplementary benefits, what that means is that um, individuals on low income, on income assistance, uh, First Nations Health Authority registered patients, those enrolled with MSP as mental health clients, uh, convention refugees, individuals on BC disability, and a wide variety of other people are eligible for subsidy insured benefits. And you have to apply for that through MSP. And what that means is that you get 10 visits a year where the government will pay towards your visit. Those 10 visits are combined through a variety of disciplines as you can see there. And again, as I said, there will be offices that charge you above that, but there'll also be offices that don't charge you above that. Uh, people also ask me about coverage for orthotics because they can be expensive. The average cost around $550. Um, and that usually includes the cost of the visit and everything combined and as well as, you know, adjustments and follow-ups. Most insurance plans, extended health plans cover them. Um, many insurance plans cover a new pair every year. Sometimes it's every two or three years. Uh, First Nations Health Authority patients are eligible every two years. And BC disability patients are eligible every three years for an orthotic, but they can get an orthopedic shoe every year as needed. And as well, veterans also are generally eligible. And if you don't have coverage for a custom device, there are a variety of over-the-counter options that can work. I always recommend you talk to your podiatrist about that first. And you know, my tidbit, uh, generic tidbit around this is don't buy anything for your shoes from the pharmacy. If you're going to buy an insult, go to a shoe store, go to Rackets and Runners, Lady Sport, Four Runners, any of these places where they're really educated in watching you walk and fitting you with shoe gear, and they'll have some insults and devices that will work quite well for most people. What happens when you come into the office? We're going to ask about your general medical health. We're going to want to know how long have you been diabetic? What is your A1C? You're going to obviously be asked to take off your shoes and socks. We can't see your feet if your socks are still on. And we recommend that patients don't wear skirts or dresses because you will be on an exam table. As Dr. Tan mentioned, we're going to check for your pulses. We'll do it to make sure your circulation is good. We're going to check, do a nerve test, usually using a little monofilament or a tuning port. That helps us evaluate for neuropathy. We'll inspect your feet, any wounds or calluses or thick toenails. We'll do breed. We'll watch you walk. And then together, we come up with a plan to ensure good foot health. Why should you see a podiatrist? Personally, I believe anybody should see a podiatrist when they're having any foot issues, but diabetics for sure. Lifetime risk for diabetic foot ulcer is about 25% versus in the non-diabetic patient is 2%. We recommend that all diabetics, regardless of how good your blood sugar control is, see a podiatrist at minimum yearly. 
but for many, every six months and for some every three months is important. There was a, a relatively recent study done where they looked at uh, ulcers and wounds and amputations in Calgary versus Edmonton. And in Calgary, podiatrists were involved and the amputation rate was 45% less than what it was in Edmonton. That's a pretty big difference. Um, and most Canadian and uh, American studies show between a 45 to 80% decrease in adverse outcomes such as amputations when a podiatrist involved, is involved. So it's a relatively simple thing that you can do that can make a really big difference. If you haven't seen a podiatrist, I'd really recommend that you make an appointment today. Um, I do have three locations, as Dr. Tom mentioned. They're all in Vancouver on the east side, on Fraser Street, on Kingsway and Grandview Highway. The phone numbers are there on the screen for you, as well as the website and the email. If you have a, you know, we'll try and get through as many questions we can today as well, but you're also always welcome to shoot me an email. I always respond to them as quickly as I can. So hopefully that provides you with a, a basic outline of, of some foot health and, and we'll move on and maybe we can answer some of these questions and answers, but I'll throw it back to Dr. Tom for now. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Uh, Thanks, MND, but Tristan running the show. So we, we got to do whatever he tells us to do. Thank you, Dr. Randala. So our audience was very excited about this episode and you've certainly lived up to the high expectations. We're going to get to a few of the questions now. We even had a couple emailed prior to the episode. The first one's from Kim. What are the early symptoms of neuropathy? I have some numbness, loss of feeling and cramping in my left big toe. Should I be concerned? So those are all uh, symptoms, early symptoms of neuropathy. When it's limited to one big toe, though, it could also be that a sp one specific nerve is being irritated by some arthritis in the big toe. So I wouldn't be overly worried about it, early symptoms, but I would definitely get it checked out. So early symptoms is burning, tingling, pain, usually starts into your toes. As it progresses, it comes up further into your foot and into your ankle. Okay, the next one here is from Margaret. She asks, should diabetics get pedicures? Oh, that is a million dollar question. My patients ask if anybody should get pedicures and I always, you know, the correct answer here is no, but you may see me get a pedicure once in a while if you're walking down the, down the street. Um, the problem with pedicures is if the, the, the technician accidentally nicks or cuts you, it could lead to a wound and an infection pretty quickly. Pedicures are accessible for fungal infections as well and for warts. No matter how clean the salon is, it is always a bit of a risk. If you're having trouble cutting your toenails, it is a service that most podiatrists help provide you with. If you're going to go in for a pedicure, make sure you tell them that you're diabetic. Ask them not to cut your toenails or do any cutting of any calluses. Go in, get a foot massage, get your toenails painted. That's totally fine, but make sure you let them know you're diabetic and don't let them do any cutting. Interesting. We have one from Art now. He asks, I have a needling pain, which is more than pins and needles, across the tops of both feet. I've been using Betaderm cream twice a day, but it only helps for a few minutes. Any suggestions? Yeah, so I, I'm surprised that the Betaderm helps because it doesn't usually help with kind of nerve pain and what you're describing is nerve pain. There are um, a variety of topical prescription medications that would probably work better. It's difficult to necessarily say without examining and being sure what the exact cause of it is. Um, one of the over-the-counter remedies that people try uh, that's relatively harmless is to use the icy, um, it's not icy hot, but it's just the icy cold, the deep freeze ointment that you can get at the pharmacies like London Drugs. And it kind of soothes down some of the burning and stabbing pain. The other thing that some people try over the counter again, relatively harmless, is capsaicin, which is a topical ointment made from red chili peppers. It usually causes an increase in the burning temporarily, but helps with the pain long term. The next question is from Michael, and it's to Dr. Elliot. Dr. Elliot, is there any treatment for neuropathy? <laughs> well, you know. Um, the best treatment uh, for neuropathy is prevention. I think you've heard that before. So, um, you know, we always want you to to do the best you can with your with your blood sugar control. Um, what we've learned over the years is that if you've got numbness, we we can't make it better, but we can stop it getting worse. So, 
the moment you've got numbness and, and Dr. Randawa or I or one of our colleagues confirms that it's diabetic neuropathy, then the moment you improve your sugar, you are going to hopefully stop progression. And if you can't stop it, at least slow down the progression. So that's the numbness. Um, the pain um, usually gets better when, when you improve the blood glucose control, though ironically, sometimes the pain gets worse before it gets better. So it can get worse for a few months and then get, and then get better. Um, we mentioned some of the nerve damage that gets better on its own. So that would be a, 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 lid, a, a lid drop or a ptosis or a foot drop. Those often get better on their own. Treating the pain itself is, is, is very problematic. Um, Dr. Wandoa talked about the capsaicin cream. Um, most of the pills that you hear about, um, uh, Pregabalin, Lyrica, um, most of these drugs are not particularly effective. They tend to cause sleepiness. So people complain less about the pain, not because the pain's gone away, but because they're sleepy. So the bottom line is prevention is where it's at for, in terms of a treatment. Noted, prevention. The next question is from Hugh. I have dry feet. Is this a problem? I think it's partly because I walk a lot. This is to Dr. Randala. Yes, dry feet can be a problem and it's very common in diabetics as well because when your nerves aren't functioning as well, your skin quality is gonna decrease. Definitely walking, which is great for your health, can exasperate that. Uh, the problem with dry feet is it's more likely to crack. And when you get a crack, it's more likely to become a wound, which can then become infected and so on down the, down the, the hill. There are a variety of emollients that you can use. I usually recommend over-the-counter um, Vaseline, petroleum jelly. Do not use it between your toes, but around your heels and elsewhere. After you take a shower is the best time to do it. Use a little bit. If your dry skin is quite severe, your diabetes is out of control, there are certainly some over-the-counter um, medications or options that are more dedicated towards the diabetes. There's something called Skin Fix, which has a diabetic foot cream. It's available over-the-counter, and there are also prescription options if it's really bad. But it's certainly something you want to look at. Thank you, Dr. Randala. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Afshin Azir, a pediatric... <laughs> a pediatric nephrologist who has been a case manager at BC Diabetes for a little over a year. Afshin. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks uh, to Sam. Um, as he said, uh, I'm Dr. Afshin Azir and uh, I'm working in BC Diabetes uh, with Dr. Uh, Jim Elliott and his uh, wonderful we apologize for the technical we a, difficulty. We have a technical problem. He's going to sit in my office. Okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Apshin Uh And uh, as uh, Tristan said, I have been working uh, in BC Diabetes uh, with Dr. Tom Elliott and his wonderful team uh, since last year. Uh, my background, I graduated from uh, Tehran uh, University of Medical Science in 1991. Uh, I uh, worked as a GP for five years and then I completed uh, a residency in pediatric uh, and I work as a pediatrician in PICU uh, for two years. Uh, then I completed uh, a fellowship in, uh, uh, I mean, uh, pediatric nephrology uh, or problem with kidneys in kids. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, I work as an associate pro professor uh, in medical school for 10 years. I also had opportunity to uh, do fellowships, two fellowships, one in Melbourne in 2004 uh, at Royal Children's Hospital, the other one in 2006 um, in uh, University of Alberta 
renal pathology. I came here to Vancouver with my family in 2009. And uh, before joining to BC Diabetes, I work in research field, uh, mostly in cancer treatment. Uh, and also I got my uh, master's degree from uh, UBC uh, in health administration. So um, I have a passion in learning first. Uh, I have two kids, my daughters, Ava, she's a clinical pharmacist and my son, Arvin, uh, he's, studying in, uh, he's studying at BCIT. Um, I mean, in interior design field. Uh, my family is very important for me. Uh, and if uh, I want to say some things about what I have learned during this uh, COVID-19 situation, um, I can say that uh, I realized how important is little things in our life. I uh, realized how to appreciate these little things in my life. Um, I, I have had times, more times to uh, think about myself. And um, so I realized that I'm a very extroverted person. So I need to be around people. Um, if I wanna uh, tell you one uh, or give you one message, uh, it should be um, be kind, be generous, love each other, and uh, take care of yourself and your family. Thank, thank you, Dr. Azir. And to our guests, our apologies about the technical difficulties, which we wish were not happening on our 13th episode. We promise to hopefully no longer have them by our 30th, though. We're going to get back to the questions here. Dr. Randawa, I have neuropathy. Should I be cutting my own toenails? If you have neuropathy and you can't feel your, your toes, I would recommend again to cutting your own toenails. Come, I had a podiatrist do it. Most recommendations are to do have your toenails trimmed about every six to eight weeks. So you'd be coming in you know, six times a year uh, and really lowering your risk of problems with amputations. If you're cutting your toenails and you have neuropathy and you can't see and your nails are thick, you're at a pretty high risk of creating a wound that could then cause more significant problems. We have a follow-up from Suzanne. It's a similar question. What should I do if I cut into my flesh accidentally while cutting my toenails? Yeah, so that's why you should um, definitely get help with cutting your toenails, but it certainly happens. Um, you know, hopefully it's okay. I, I would definitely clean out the area, use some topical antibiotics and polysporin. And then if you're diabetic, make an appointment with your doctor or your podiatrist to have it looked at just to make sure that it is not something that needs something stronger in order to heal. The faster we can start treating a wound, the more likely you get a good outcome. Okay, the next question is from Zach to Dr. Elliot. Ever since my sugars improved two months ago, my feet are burning more than ever. Should I be worried and what's going on? Thank you, Zach. Well, I think it's very likely you're one of these people who, in whom it's going to get worse before it gets better. We call it regenerative neuropathy, where the nerves suddenly grow and the neuropathy is where you lose the insulation around the nerve. And so the insulation is growing back and causing the pain. So I would be very optimistic. It'll be much better in a month or two and gone in four months. Okay, our next question is from Anne to Dr. Randala. Some podiatrists recommend against using orthotics because they interfere with the normal mechanical use slash strength of muscles in the foot and leg. Does the support of an orthotic also immobilize the foot in ways that can weaken parts of it over time? Can you discuss the pros and cons of orthotics as well as highly supportive shoes and running shoes, especially when compared with barefoot shoes? Sure, so um, an orthotic is meant to correct abnormal biomechanics. Uh, so if you have a normal gait and that can be very well evaluated by your podiatrist, you may not need an orthotic. Those people who do, 
and, and I, I try to describe it this way. An orthotic is not like a brace or a cast. It's not making your foot immobile and weakening it. What it's going to do is it's going to force your muscles and tendons and bones and joints to work in the way that is ideal. So it's going to strengthen the muscles that need to be strengthened and it's going to get you walking back into a more neutral position where you'll have less problems, less friction, less, less issues developed. So the idea that um, orthotics can weaken your foot is, is a bit of an old wives tale. It just doesn't work that way at all. Um, in terms of barefoot running, uh, just don't do it. There was a big, there was a big trend towards barefoot running and uh, you know, the sock type shoes a couple of years ago. It created a lot of business for podiatrists a lot of problems develop from that. I have not seen anything positive. There are some people who feel like they get better traction. Um, the risks far, far, far outweigh any potential benefit. Definitely wear a supportive shoe and be fitted for your shoe from a good uh, shoe store properly. Well, that's fascinating to hear. The next question for Dr. Elliot is from Paul. I've had diabetes for the last 16 years, and I'm concerned that I only have 50% feeling on my feet. Is it normal? Hello, Paul. Um, well, it's not normal. You know, if we could, I, I don't know which, I have many Pauls in my practice, and I'm not sure which, what, which Paul I'm speaking to. But if, if we could, take back the last 16 years and, and five years before it when you may have had diabetes without knowing. Um, if your sugars had been in the optimal range, say an A1C less than seven or a time in range on a CGM of ab above 70%, it's unlikely you would have got that. So, so, you know, that's the past and we can't do anything about it. You know, in the future, of course, we can do the best job we can and, and I, I, I'm relatively confident that your neuropathy is not going to get significantly worse. So, so I would be positive and, um, and uh, keep, make sure you keep uh, me and the case managers working hard to, to give you whatever help you need to get your sugar under control. Okay, at this point, we're gonna dive into Arthur's Corner. Dr. Weisinger, who is our staff scientist, will be discussing dietary fiber relating to diabetes today. Arthur. Thanks, Tristan. As Tristan says, today I'd like to talk a little bit about fiber in your diet. We all know that dietary fiber is important, but there are new studies that show just how important it is for people with diabetes. Foods like whole grains, leafy vegetables, and beans also have, also have significant amounts of fiber, and they're great to include in your diet. Slide, please. In fact, Higher fiber can save lives. A group of scientists in New Zealand just published a very large study looking at the effects of dietary fiber for, for people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. They found that consuming about 35 grams of fiber per day resulted in a 35% reduction in premature death. Our mothers were right. It's definitely important to eat your veggies. Higher fiber is important, but food processing may remove the benefits. Using CGM to monitor blood sugar following meals, the same group of scientists looked at the difference between eating whole grains or ultra-processed grain and found that whole grains stabilized blood sugar while processed grain did not. Slide, please. Just to give you an example of what this looks like, rolled oats is an example of a minimally processed grain with high fiber. But if that same grain is highly processed, like quick oats, the value of the fiber is significantly lower, even though the original fiber is still present. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Arthur. The, the take home lesson from these studies is that fiber in the diets for people with diabetes can actually save lives and also eat foods that are minimally processed to get the most benefit of the fiber you eat. You eat your fiber, I'll see you again next week. Thanks, Arthur. Brilliant as always. We're going to dive back into the questions now. The first one is from Alexander. Dr. Elliot, does diabetic neuropathy make varicose veins worse? That's a good question. Um, you know, varicose veins, 
the biggest cause of varicose veins is, is genetics. So if your parents had it, you're probably going to get it. The second one is overweight. Um, but back to your question, does neuropathy make it worse? Um, if you're overweight, it may have contributed. Um, and keeping a, a, a decent degree of, of activity and mobility is going to help. So I don't think I answered your question. Dr. Rundell, I see you nodding. What, 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 what do you have to add on that one? Yeah, I agree with you fully. I think that uh, neuropathy and varicose veins are often occur together during the progression of disease, but are not necessarily directly related. Varicose veins are in relation to your circulation uh, and your, your neuropathy is coming from your nerves. So it's slightly different systems, but they often do happen um, somewhat together for many people, just based on the trajectory of age and progression of disease. I, I'm, Tristan, I'm gonna add one thing. Um, veins, when I talked about blood vessels getting damaged by diabetes, it's the arteries. The, on the, in that diagram, the red ones, the veins do not get damaged by diabetes. I should have made that point. Okay, the next question for Dr. Randawa is from Glenn. My doctor told me that I should always wear support stockings because I live with diabetes. Is that true? And could you speak to it? Well, if your doctor recommended it, I would probably do it. There's a uh, compression stockings and support stockings is, is a double-edged sword a little bit with uh, diabetics because sometimes it can, you know, prevent some of that arterial blood coming into your foot and allowing wounds to heal. Um, compression stockings are great for people with varicose veins with intermittent claudication. So it, it, it's, it's unfortunately not a simple diabetic should wear compression stockings or they should not wear compression stockings. It's a very individual decision. Um, and I would take your doctor's advice on that. If you want to get a second opinion, you're always welcome to do that as well. The next question is from Donald. I suspect both of you are going to want to have a crack at it. So we're going to start with Dr. Elliot. I am a type one diabetic for the past 51 years and have some neuropathy, but in the past five years seem to have vasculopathy in my feet and lower legs causing itching, discoloration and hair loss. Is there any treatment recommended for this condition? Itch relief primarily. Hello, Don. I know who Don is. Not many people have, have had type one diabetes for 51 years. It used to be that you got a, you know, a letter from the queen. Don, Don is so, so, you know, 51 years is a long time and a lot of stuff happens. Um, itch is not typical of, uh, it's not typical of peripheral vascular disease. Um, you know, for that, I want you to have the best blood pressure, the best cholesterol and the best sugar control. Um, and I'm going to let Dr. Randawa address the itch and, and the other things. Sure. So we want to figure out where the itch is coming from. As Dr. Tom says, you know, it's, it's not often a part of the circulation issue. Sometimes there can be a little bit of a, a skin issue. There are topical ointments we can use for itch relief, but we really have to figure out where it is. Um, you know, yeah, that, that's all I really can say on that. Sometimes it, it's good to get a vascular consult if you're really concerned about vasculopathy as well and see if they have any opinions. I, I, Don, I have one more comment. I have a friend who's a dermatologist and he says the, the worst thing to ever get, the thing he, he hates getting sent is people with itch because there's no treatment for it. Okay, we have one from Max here. Dr. Elliot. My orthopedic surgeon was talking about trophic changes resulting from diabetic neuropathy. Are those something I have to be concerned about? Oh yes, that, that's most certainly, that's why you've got to go see Dr. Wandawa to get her to off, you know, off weights, get the, get the, uh, the foot, the, the shoe insert. And Amandi, please tell him more. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as your nerves get damaged, it, you know, your muscles aren't innervated as well. And so you get that kind of thing where he's talking about the sharp cold foot, which can lead to all sorts of issues in terms of pain and discomfort and trouble walking. Um, and there's a variety of things that we can do early on um, to try and decrease the risk of that. So certainly, certainly something to, you know, not lose sleep over, but certainly get evaluated on a regular basis. Okay, at this point, we're gonna to go to Dr. Elliot, who's gonna talk about our diabetic 
foot ulcer study. Dr. Elliott. Thanks, Tristan. Well, regular um, attendees to the webinars will know that we've been doing some studies with Sanitize. Sanitize is a company that makes a topical um, antibacterial, antiviral uh, solution that, uh, that, that we were involved in a, two COVID studies where they gargled and, um, and used, used it to wash out their nasal sinuses. Um, the same nitric oxide releasing solution, which kills bacteria and viruses, um, is being studied for people who have diabetic foot ulcers. So if you have ulceration on your foot, the foot is not too infected, the ulcer is not too big, and the ulcer is on the bottom of the foot, then you may be eligible for this study. The idea is that with a little bit of infection, not, not obvious infection, if you can kill off the bugs on top of the ulcer, it may speed up the, uh, the healing. On the, on the graphic, it talks about the ankle brachial index. Um, if, if it's very low, it means you have a problem with your circulation. So people with bad circulation wouldn't be eligible for this study. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. This one is from Chandrika for Dr. Randawa. Why the bottom of my foot get burning sensation, especially at night when I go to bed? So that's what we've been talking about. That's a very, uh, that is definitely a sign of neuropathy and some early damage uh, to your nerves, likely secondary to the diabetes. Okay. One of the things I'll also say, for people who get burning problems uh, at night, which makes it harder to sleep, uh, try soaking your feet in some cold water before bed. That can help alleviate some of the discomfort as well. That's a good suggestion. The next question is from Hugh to Dr. Tom. Occasionally I get a cut on the heel. I use some over-the-counter heel cream and it seems to resolve the issue after a few days. Do you recommend anything else? Are there any problems with that? Well. Um... Obviously, we don't want you to, you know, cracking of heels is the commonest thing. And, I, and I'm with Dr. Landau. I, I swear by Vaseline on my feet and then I wear socks to bed. And the next, after a couple of days, my, my heel cracking is better. Um, in terms of the cut, um, I'm going to suggest a topical antibiotic as well. Um, anything else to add, uh, Amand? Unfortunately, you are cutting out there, um, but for cracking heels, yeah, uh, moisturizer, moisturizer on a daily basis. And what, what about if, if, if the heel is cut, would you use a topical antibiotic? Oh, yeah. So if you have a heel fissure and a little a wound there, um, you can, those get so painful. And if you get a little steri strip or a little piece of medical tape and tape the cut closed, your pain goes away pretty quickly. And then, yeah, a topical antibiotic. The next question is from Donna. Dr. Okay. Randoa, my feet are completely numb, especially my right foot, but when given the test, I can feel it. What can I do about it? I'm also starting to get shooting sharp pains throughout my feet. Yeah, so that, that's not uncommon that you'll come into the office and you'll, you know, patient will be complaining about that, but then on exam, you can feel the monofilament and the vibration sensation is, is within normal limits. I, I, we call that early subjective neuropathy, so it's definitely a sign that there's something going on with the nerves. And whether we can detect it in the office or not is, is not um, as relevant at this point. We got to then practice the daily visual foot checks, uh, you know, some of the other things that we can do to try and manage this and prevent it from getting worse. Thank you. Dr. Elliott, I'm worried because I've lived with diabetes for 30 years. My father had to have an amputation at my age. Is that going to happen to me? And am I at increased likelihood? Well, if, if, if me and my staff do our job, you are not going to get an amputation. So that's the good news. You know, things have, have been so many advances in the last 30 years. You know, we have uh, smart, not doctors and nurses. We have better podiatrists, doctors, nurses, case managers. We all know our trades better. We've got better tools, better medication. So I, I would be very optimistic. Dr. Randawa, John asks, are you seeing patients at your office right now? What have yes. you to do during COVID? We, we never 
fully closed, but we were only open one day a week to see patients with emergencies. And that most of our emergencies were diabetic patients with wounds or calluses or ulcers that we never want you to wait. We are now uh, seeing uh, patients on a regular full schedule. Our schedule is a little bit more spaced out. Uh, we're practicing social distancing, but absolutely we are seeing patients. And I believe most all podiatrists across the province are back to seeing patients regularly. Okay, at this point, we're going to go to Tom for his outro. Dr. Elliott. Thank you, Tristan. Um, Amandeep, thank you so much for being our guest expert today. Um, as always, I've, I've learned a lot, um, and I'm sure my staff and, of course, our, uh, our att attendees, so we're, we're, we're most grateful. Um, just a quick reminder that next week, we're going to dig further into insulin adjustment and carb counting. Uh, with guest uh, expert dietitian Lana Daniellis. And I'll also take the opportunity to introduce you to a new staff physician, Dr. Peter Ling, who will be covering for me when I'm on holidays. Once again, we apologize for not being able to answer all questions live. Any unanswered questions, we will provide written answers to via email shortly. Goodbye, everybody. At this point, we'd like to say a special thank you to our partners, Dr. Randawa and you, our beloved audience. If you want to find out more about Dr. Randawa, her website is metrovancouverpodiatry.com. Have a lovely end of your week and enjoy the weekend. See you next Thursday. <laughs>